Um, it's really quite an honor to speak with you here at the Karolinska Institute and a pleasure for me to return to Sweden uh, after 50 years. I was here 50 years ago um, when I lived with my family in Copenhagen and my parents were invited to the uh, Nobel Prize for Medicine dinners. So they took the whole family and parked myself and my siblings with their friends and attended the dinners. But at least I got to see some of Stockholm and I have very vivid memories and, um, and, and a lot of those memories have come back to me over the last couple of days. I should also say that Sweden in my um, family has served a very uh, important role in that uh, uh, during the Second World War, uh, my mother was a, a, re a refugee from Germany and she uh, received asylum in Sweden. So if Sweden had not generously allowed her to, uh, to come into Sweden, I, I would not be here today to give this talk. So thank you. Um, so I, I'm happy to talk with you about uh, some of the research we've done. Um, as Alexander said, I've, I've been involved with psychedelic research going back many years. I've conducted um, studies with uh, MDMA and uh, ayahuasca, and, uh, and we uh, also um, have piloted the, uh, the first uh, psilocybin treatment of advanced cancer anxiety. And, uh, and I'm really happy to share, uh, you know, the rationale for the study, uh, what we learned, and uh, so, some, of our, uh, some of our findings. And our work ha has helped facilitate a an expansion of the field and uh, some generation of new studies. You know, the whole area of psychedelics in medicine and psychiatry, um, I, I believe, is undergoing a, a somewhat of a renaissance. For decades, it was... Uh, you know, really uh, neglected, pushed aside, and not quite possible to conduct this research. It had almost become taboo after the 1960s and the cultural and p political turmoil of that time. But over the last 25 years in the United States, uh, the regulatory agencies have become very receptive towards our developing, very careful uh, studies, and, and, uh, there, and there have been studies throughout Europe as well, uh, so we're opening the door once again to what I believe is a very, very exciting and potentially very valuable area to the fields of psychiatry and medicine. So, okay, so that's, this is my, um, my, my talk today, psilocybin at the end of life. And uh, I received grant support primarily from the Hefter Research Institute. Uh, Betsy Gordon came in when we were short of funds and really helped us uh, sustain our work. And the National Institute of Mental Health have not as yet funded directly any psychedelic studies, but they did fund our inpatient clinical research center at uh, Harbor UCLA, which, uh, without which we could not have done this study at that time. This is an overview of the topics I will talk about. Um, I think it is important to talk about what are the roots of um, th this work. And the roots really go back uh, millennia to uh, the indigenous people who knew quite a lot about uh, the psychotropic plants that grew in, in their areas. They, they understood their range of effects. They understood how to establish effective safety parameters. And there's, there's still a lot to learn. So we'll talk a little bit about ethnobotany uh, anthropology, uh, chemistry and toxicity of uh, psilocybin, uh, some of the clinical research um, with psychedelics uh, in general. I will review a little bit some of the uh, findings of our, uh, uh, of our predecessors back in the 50s and 60s, uh, who were really the true pioneers of psychedelic research. Um, We'll talk about the role of using a hallucinogen treatment model with uh, p uh, individuals with advanced cancer and reactive anxiety and depression and demoralization. Keep in mind here, we're talking entirely about treating the, uh, the reactive anxiety and depression, not about the cancer per se. I think it's important to maintain that uh, distinction. Talk a little bit about uh, some of the recent research and the new generation of uh, researchers, particularly with, uh, with psilocybin. Then I'll tell you a bit about our study. I'll tell you about how we designed the study and uh, the approval process we went through. I'll share with you some of our, uh, our results. 
I'll talk a little bit about some of the results of um, our uh, uh, companion studies and, uh, that followed up our, our pilot investigation. And, and then at the end, um, I, I'd like to just briefly review with you some of the, uh, the challenges that I think we're going to have to address in the future. As, as this field moves forward, as it gains strength, as it builds momentum, there are some issues that have to be uh, understood and, um, and, and part of the ongoing dialogue. So let's, uh, let's get going. Okay, so the um, ethnobotany of uh, psilocybin, there are a variety of uh, mushroom species that contain the, uh, the hallucinogen psilocybin. The one we're most familiar with is uh, right there, psilocybin cubensis, but there are other uh, mushroom species as well that are uh, rich in, the, uh, in alkaloids, different concentrations. I'll show you a little data on that. Here's the distribution of psilocybin worldwide. There are now identified uh, over, actually now by now over 200 known species of mushrooms containing psilocybin, and their distribution is very curiously uh, increasing around the world. So you can see, um, particularly in Northwest uh, Canada and the United States, western parts of South America, throughout Central America, and vast swaths of, uh, of Europe and one would assume up in Scandinavia as well. So, curiously, um, mushrooms appear spontaneously in areas that are undergoing, uh, have undergone recent habitation by humans. Uh, they follow the course of human expansion, and uh, they're found where uh, people congregate, and. Uh, and it's a, it's a curious phenomena that where uh, humans settle, mushrooms tend to appear. And curiously, they, uh, mushrooms have, uh, are, are associated with, uh, with cattle, with the domestication of cattle. They are corporophilic. They grow on cow dung. That, that cow dung serves as a, kind of a, a, as a natural nutrient uh, for, for them. These pictures here are, are mushroom stones from uh, Central America, throughout Central America, uh, there, there are, there's ample um, archaeological evidence of prior cultures, civilizations that utilize psilocybin uh, mushrooms as well as other uh, plants containing uh, hallucinogenic alkaloids that were of vital importance to the native peoples of, of those regions and to their cultures. And we'll talk a little bit about what happened there. Um, again, archaeological evidence. This is, um, these are breastplates found at a burial site in uh, uh, the, the nation of Colombia. These were breastplates placed, placed on the deceased, a, a, a high, a, 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 and these were gold breastplates, so this was obviously a, uh, a someone of distinction within the local culture, and these uh, mushroom caps are obvious to the eye. So Paul Stamets, who's uh, one of, an eminent uh, uh, mycologist who has specialized in the study of hallucinogenic mushrooms, has said that the course of human history has been dramatically affected by the use of psilocybin mushrooms and will continue to be for years to come. And I would wholeheartedly agree with Dr. Stamets. And um, uh, from time memorial, uh, psilocybin and mushrooms, and now in its laboratory synthesized form, is uh, playing a, did, has played a significant role and is now starting to gain the attention and, and indeed even even the respect of modern investigators. So, what happened to those native cultures? Uh, you know, particularly in uh, South America and Central America. Uh, the, the use of hallucinogenic plants were a, a vital element of their, uh, of their healing processes, of their uh, spiritual rituals. Uh, it formed the bedrock of those civilizations, uh, psilocybin-containing mushrooms as well as other uh, plants. This is Xochipilli, the god of flowers. And uh, I don't know if you could see it, but uh, throughout the, the, the sculpture, there are uh, different hallucinogenic plants that are, that are carved into the stone. Um, 
And uh, however, when in the um, 16th century and 17th century, when the Europeans traveled uh, to the New World and uh, and you know overwhelmed the native people and uh, took possession of, uh, of of their land, of their property, uh, of, of the people as well, they observed these ceremonies using hallucinogenic plants. And the Spaniards, and who played the, the the strongest role here, were you know very um, very identified with their uh, their religion of Christianity, and they were rather shocked by what they saw of native peoples using these plant compounds that induced reverie states, uh, induced visionary states that seemed to be of great import to them individually and to, to, to them collectively. And, uh, and here is a, uh, um, a Spanish friar named uh, Bernardino de Sahagun who, who, said, who observed that after these rituals using mushrooms and other plants, he said that when the effects of the mushrooms had left them, he had observed a group ceremony, and this was almost always used in group context, they consulted, the individuals consulted among themselves and told one another what they had seen in vision. They would ask prior to the experience, they would ask questions of whatever was of import to them at the time. You know, how might they facilitate he healing of an ill individual? How might they find gain, you know, for the community to eat, so to survive? And at the time of the arrival of the Spaniards and the Portuguese in Brazil, they were certainly asking how should they deal with these uh, odd-looking foreigners from across the sea who had all sorts of technologies that were absent in the New World. And... Um, and so, as in today's model, it's very important therapeutically when you're working with someone prior to the experience to review the intention. Why are you having this experience? The indigenous people never consume these compounds for purposes of uh, recreation or, or to have, have a good time. This is not at all the purpose. It was very serious. It was for spiritual purposes or for purposes of, of healing or, uh, you know, or to ask questions, hopefully to receive answers that were vital, not even so much to the individual, but to the society as, as a collective. But again, this is all so very foreign and so very threatening, uh, particularly to the Spaniards who arrived. They, they were in particular concerned that Spanish settlers might become intrigued by the ceremonies of the native peoples and enter into these ceremonies themselves. And that had actually started to happen. And this was, you know, a very frightening notion because it might, you know, take them away from the belief system they were expected to hold on to, which was, you know, the core, you know, Catholic or Christian beliefs that they had been inculcated with uh, prior to their uh, arrival in, in, uh, in the New World. So it's a very actually horrible and ugly chapter in, in our history of what happened to the native peoples throughout the New World. There, there, there was um, deliberate uh, and effective um, campaigns to uh, eradicate native culture and to eradicate many of the natives themselves. Uh, and the use of plant hallucinogens were deemed as, uh, as heresy. They, they were vehicles of the devil, and the Spaniards endeavored to uh, to repress them, to expunge their use at whatever at whatever price. So, in 1616, the a ruling was made applying the laws, the very brutal and uh, punitive laws of the Holy Inquisition, to native peoples and even Spanish settlers who would dare to participate in these rituals where psilocybin and other hallucinogens were being used. And here, here you can see, you know, these pictures, you know, drawn by um, a Spanish friar, Hernando Ruiz de Alarcón, who was an inquisitor, and who, and you can see just the diabolical looking shaman or practitioner of, uh, of, of these plants. And um, 
Ruiz de Alacan, he, he wrote of these as idolatries and said, and observed that uh, when they are drunk, having taken these sub substances and they are deprived of their senses, they communicate with the devil and he tells them matters that take away their judgment and deceive them. So these were objects of, of really of great danger to the Europeans who had come to the New World. And, um, and again, they, um, they brutally exterminated those who persisted with native cultures. So eventually, the use of such plants were either in some areas completely eliminated or they went deeply underground and became disguised among native peoples, e even to the degree that they became incorporated in some areas within uh, Christian ritual. So there was this blending, this, this uh, these kind of uh, syncretic process where the new world culture and belief systems and practices were you know, kind of incorporated quietly. This is not broadcast to the Europeans, but um, these were incorporated into um, religious ceremonies that were acceptable to the overlords of the region who were the, uh, the conquistadors and those who followed. Okay, so we know that um, psilocybin, there's good archaeological evidence that psilocybin was used and was a vital part of many cultures around the world for many, many millennia. There's, there's um, uh, you know, archaeological findings have demonstrated these go back thousands and thousands of years. This is, a, uh, this is actually a drawing by the artist Kathleen Harrison, but it's based on a cave painting uh, found on the uh, Tassili Plain in southern Algeria, and this is a mushroom shaman. And you can see the mushrooms lining his or her uh, uh, appendages, or wrapping around the torso. And curiously, there's a beehive mask, a mask that's shaped like a beehive. So what's the significance of that? The significance was that at that time, of course, there was no refrigeration, and these these Mushrooms were seasonal, and the native peoples of that region would want to preserve them, and honey turns out to be a good preservative for mushrooms. So that's the, that's the role of, of, of the beehive mask, you know, why a shaman would, um, would, would have one. So, um, so again, around the world, the, the, there, there was use of whatever hallucinogenic plants grew in regions, indigenous people would inevitably learn what what they what they you know what they were and how to utilize them which plants would might be toxic and not to be used which plants might be sources of nutrition and which plants had visionary qualities which could be used for for their systems of healing and for their religious spiritual rituals so then, you know, time evolves and uh, modern civilization emerges and the use of such plants, not only in the new world, but in the old world as well, were expunged. I mean, there's also good evidence that um, prior to the emergence of, uh, or the imposition, let's say, of Christianity uh, in Europe, in Central Europe, in, in Germany, this, there's some good information from the German anthropologist Christian Rach that, um, Mushrooms were used uh, in uh, uh, ceremony among the pagan tribes. Uh, it, when um, uh, findings emerged of ancient uh, 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 beverages used in ceremony, they were found to have traces of hallucinogenic mushrooms. So they had a role. But again, with advancing civilization, uh, direct experience of a profound psychospiritual state was deemed unacceptable, and the use either disappeared altogether, as occurred throughout most of Europe, or, as in the case in the New World, went deeply underground and became disguised. So, moving into the modern era, uh, it, it, it was believed in many quarters that plant hallucinogens, uh, certain plant hallucinogens, may not have existed at all. Uh, mushrooms, for instance, were thought in the last century, up to the mid-century point, there's, uh, I think, general belief that mushrooms were 
that either the stories of mushroom effects were either mythology, myth, or perhaps some confusion with peyote, uh, which was known to contain mescaline and uh, accepted. But then in the early 1950s, uh, psychedelics uh, be, um, emerged in modern culture, and it was precipitated, interestingly enough, by the investigations, not of a scientist, not of a formal scientist or, um, or physician, but rather a Wall Street banker named R. Gordon Wasson. He was a vice president of J.P. Morgan, who married a Russian woman named Valentina Pavlova, and they, they, on their honeymoon, uh, they, uh, uh, Wasson found out that his new wife was was fascinated with mushrooms. She wanted to take him into the woods on their honeymoon to pick mushrooms that she would mix into a, a grand feast. Uh, and Wasson was horrified because from the culture he came from, mushrooms were dangerous and potentially the source of poison. So um, he thought their marriage might end very quickly, both being poisoned by these wild mushrooms Instead, they had a delicious meal, and they also generated a shared interest in how different cultures around the world had different attitude towards mushrooms. The Russians, for instance, were rather mycophilic. They had an affinity for them, and mushroom hunting was, uh, it was you know, common in, let's, in Russia, where Valentina came from. Wasson's family came from Great Britain, which was more mycophobic. They had a persistent fear and aversion towards mushrooms. But be as it may, through the course of their long marriage, they explored how different cultures had different attitudes towards mushrooms. And then in the early 50s, a friend of theirs, the very, very uh, eminent British writer, Robert Graves, who wrote, I don't know, I, I Claudius, Claudius the God, wrote brilliant, uh, some of my favorite books, but, um, uh, Graves wrote to Watson saying that he had heard a rumor of an extant mushroom cult in the highlands of North Central Mexico. Watson, being a rather intrepid sort of individual, organized an expedition, and, uh, and this was not a developed area. They had to get you know, donkeys to carry provisions, and they, they trekked you know, for some days to get to um, this uh, a village in Oaxaca that Graves had, had suggested they go to. And there they made the acquaintance of a Mexican uh, healer or curandara named Maria Sabina. Uh, she invited Wasson to join her in, facilit she was facilitating a velada or a, a healing ceremony and Wasson did. And the, the course of modern history in many respects was changed. He then went back to the United States and uh, wrote up his experiences. He happened to be good friends with a man named Henry Luce, who was the publisher of Life magazine, a popular magazine, not a scientific magazine. And Luce encouraged Wasson to submit his article to him. So here you have the discovery of mushrooms that cause strange visions. And by the way, this has nothing to do with the story about mushrooms. That's a different story. That's Burt Law, a Broadway comedic actor of that time. Not, not to be confused with a, uh, you know, a mushroom spirit or anything. <laughs> OK. A New York banker goes to Mexico's mountains to participate in the age-old rituals of Indians who choose strange growths that produce visions. True. OK. So here, here's a picture of Wasson in his latter years with a, uh, a mushroom stone, and kind of an archaeological find from Central America. And here is Maria Sabina, the Mexican curandara, handing Wasson the mushroom that he would then consume at this healing ceremony. And Wasson had a profound experience. It really knocked his socks off. He, he had visions of extraordinary vividness, he had remarkable, he felt insight into his own issues, understood how to resolve problems, and was just um, so profoundly impacted by the extraordinary beauty of the experience and the, 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 also the deep 
spiritual sense he had from it. But this is not to say that the, this always happens. And certainly there's no lack of examples of individuals who take hallucinogens, including mushrooms, under adverse conditions who have very, very frightening experiences. And here, here is a picture from an um, English magazine in the 1870s. Apparently there was a, uh, uh, a, a, a flurry of incidents of, of, of English men and women who had picked the wrong kind of mushrooms and had become uh, very, very frightened of the experience. So again, the point here being that, um, uh, you know, with some individuals under optimal, appropriate conditions, uh, it can be a remarkably positive experience. However, with others who are poorly prepared or not prepared, uh, who may have significant underlying vulnerability, all bets are off. So one has to be very careful. And certainly, if we look back in social use of hallucinogens, including mushrooms, we see that many individuals report deriving great benefit, but we also know of stories of individuals who get into serious difficulties and sometimes with serious consequences. So one has to be very, very, you know, careful and very attentive and, um, you know, and um, not, uh, and, you know, some individuals, this is not the right medicine or the right experience. Certain conditions are not the right conditions. Uh, one bit of insight from the researchers of the 1960s was that set and setting are critical to outcome when looking at hallucinogen experience. Set is uh, who is that individual? What is the psychological makeup? What underlying vulnerabilities do they have? What is their intention? Do they have an intention? Um, setting is where is it being? Where is the experience? How safe it is? Is there a facilitator or a monitor to watch over the process? Is it in a uh, an attractive location in nature or perhaps in a quiet, secluded home? Um, uh, is there someone there to answer the door if the doorbell rings? You know, or is it in a big city with a lot of noise and sensory overload without su proper support, uh, where things can go awry very quickly? And you know, as a psychiatrist, and I'm, I'm, you know, I've written quite a bit on this topic. When individuals do get into difficulty with hallucinogens, it's not. In, on a number of occasions, I've been contacted uh, to provide consultation. So I certainly have heard quite a number of stories and the common factors for, of individuals who have great difficulty, not only during, but after the experience. And the, a common factor is an individual with significant underlying psychopathology who's taking this for hedonic purposes, uh, not serious purposes, more trivial purposes, who may be mixing it with alcohol or the other substances. So. Um, Again, one has to be very, very careful and very, very prudent. But when taken under optimal conditions with properly prepared individuals for an appropriate purpose, these have the potential to be remarkable medicines, as we will discuss. So looking at serotonin, serotonin is chemically, it's 4-phosphoroxy and dimethyltryptamine, and you can see it's how close its chemical structure is to the major uh, central nervous system neurotransmitter, serotonin. So there's a, uh, an affinity of the, of, of, of the psilocybin for the serotonin, for some of the serotonin receptors. Oops. Yeah, so um, it's a tryptamine. And it's an, a tryptamine in, in the indole family. And physiologically, it has very, very low toxicity. Psychologically, as I said, one has to be very careful. But physiologically, it is not toxic. The, the body tolerates it right well. And I'll show you a little data on that in a bit. So um, it's uh, primarily active at the 5-HT2A uh, receptor also somewhat at the 2C receptor as well. The medium dose, which is what we used in our study of between 12 to 20 milligrams, uh, induces a well-controlled 
altered state of consciousness that lasts about four to six hours. And here you see the, uh, the time course. You can see the effects, uh, you, know, you know, peak around uh, an hour and a half and then, you know, subside to around uh, four to six hours. It's, it's individuals are pretty much back, back to normal. Compared to LSD, which has a far longer duration of action, and that's one reason why LSD is much more difficult to work with clinically. There are other reasons why we chose psilocybin and not LSD, but this is one of them. You know, it's a long, when you're treating someone in a treatment room, a six-hour experience, is that's a long day. Uh, it's hard to imagine what a 12-hour experience would be like. So here you have the time, you have plasma levels, and again peaking at about an hour and a half and coming down and um, you know, gradually subsiding throughout uh, the next several hours. And here it's uh, excretion in, uh, in urine and uh, you know, virtually, you know, enti almost entirely eliminated by, at 12 to 24 hours. So different, um, there are, as I said earlier, there are a number of different species of mushrooms. They contain essentially three active alkaloids, psilocybin, psilocin, and baocysteine. Psilocin is also a metabolic product of psilocybin, but it occurs on its own uh, in, in these plants. And then there's also baocysteine. And as you can see, there are differing concentrations in different species of mushrooms. Uh, cubensis is very high in psilocybin and psilocin, and the baocysteine is, is quite negligible. On the other hand, uh, psilocybin as urescence is very rich in baocysteine, uh, as is semilanciata. And the effects are somewhat different, and you know, there's never ever been any uh, laboratory or clinical research with baocysteine. So that's actually an opportunity for the future. There are many opportunities for investigators in the future. I think we're just, we've just touched the surface, you know, in terms of uh, the knowledge we've accrued and the questions we've asked. So exploring the range of effects of biocysteine is also quite important. Our clinical studies are entirely with laboratory synthesized psilocybin. So it's somewhat different than the mushroom product itself. Someone at some point needs to study Baocysteine. There was some psilocin investigation in the 50s, but it was put aside in favor of exploring psilocybin, which was thought to be more interesting. So, um, so again, back to physiological toxicity, not psychological, but physiological toxicity. Um, this is a very you know, favorable uh, you know, LD50 compared to other known compounds. And again, the mycologist Stamets says, and I wouldn't recommend this, but this is what he says. He's quoted, you would have to eat your own body weight in one sitting to ingest a physiologically toxic dose of psilocybin mushrooms. So uh, again, for most people, it's quite well tolerated, with perhaps the exception of those who have some underlying vulnerability for cardiac arrhythmias. There, there's some concerns. But for most people, and of course, no one would in them ever consider eating one's own body weight. This is Stamets just kind of making a point. But uh, again, you know, some compounds are physiologically very harsh, potentially problematic. Many of these plant hallucinogens, which were you know, tested over time, time memorial by native people, turn out to be physiologically very, very well tolerated. So the subjective effects of, um, of psilocybin clinically, here we're going to talk about, um, you know, clinical effects. Uh, it stimulates affect, it facilitates uh, introspection and insight particularly so when one is asking questions, particular questions that are of great relevance to their, to their lives. Um, there's um, some similarity to dreams and hypnagogic states. Other vision, these are other visionary, non-drug visionary states. And it, it facilitates a um, particular perceptual changes, including illusions, synesthesias, where perceptual experience is... Um, uh, unusual and kind of um, 
perceived in, in quite a typical manner, like um, hearing color or seeing sound. This, these, these, ha these can be often reported. Um, there's affective activation and alterations of, uh, of thought and time. There's a, distort there's a kind of a uh, time expands, an expansion of time. And one's thoughts, one's thinking process also, also goes through changes. And here we're talking, though, about the acute phenomena. You know, by and large, for most people, as, they, as the level of the compound reduces over time, these subjective effects subside, leaving one, perhaps, uh, with uh, quite a lot to, uh, to reflect on. So um, uh, the, the actual drug-induced experience fades, but uh, the, the insight uh, persists and is there to work on, particularly if this is done within a therapeutic context. Uh, Walter Pankey, who was very prominent in the earlier generation of researchers, was a Harvard-trained psychiatrist. He also had a doctorate of divinity, and uh, he and Bill Richards uh, developed the, uh, this notion of the, the peak experience, that psychedelics induce a powerful psycho-spiritual level experience, they call the peak experience, which is defined as, as having a unitive experience, a sense of unity or oneness, where all, all is one, a transcendence of time and space. Uh, mood becomes very, very positive, um, and uh, there's a sense of awe and reverence. Additionally, there's, there can be, there's a potential, and often one, one, one observes, a, a, the, the instilling a, a great sense of, uh, of meaning and, 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 and purpose uh, to one's existence, uh, philosophical insights, uh, along with psychological insights, and then, then there's this notion of ineffability. Uh, you know, some individuals will contend, as Pankey and Richards did, that you really cannot put words to this experience, but um, some of my colleagues will contest that and uh, have written tomes on describing this experience, so challenging the ineffability of it all. But I think traditionally it's been considered to be somewhat ineffable, beyond our capacity to all, entirely put words on the experience. And then there's paradoxicality. Things might, may not appear as they actually are or may appear to be the inverse of what is. And then transiency. It's there, it's profound, it's powerful, and then, it's, and then it fades. So it doesn't necessarily, the, the drug-induced effects don't, don't linger for excessive periods of time in, in positive experiences. So then um, I want to talk briefly about two very important uh, individuals in the history of the early history of psychedelics. The first is, I'm sure many of you are familiar with, uh, Dr. Albert Hoffman from Basel, Switzerland, who made the extraordinary, uh, almost serendipitous discovery in April of 1943 of LSD. This was, as he later described, a laboratory accident. He was uh, a specialist in synthesizing uh, ergot derivatives. In 1938, he uh, uh, synthesized a series of uh, lysergamides, and uh, LSD turned out to be number 25 in that series. And then in 1943, Hoffman says he just had an intuition, or as he called it, a presentiment, that there was something special and unique about LSD 25. So he went back and synthesized another batch, and as he's going through the chemical work of synthesizing this material, he starts to feel very woozy. In retrospect, he realized he had a cut on his hand, and he evidently absorbed some of the material he was synthesizing. So he was pretty shaky and f thought he was coming down with something and uh, went home, slept it off. This was April 16, 1943, but was very curious. So a few days later, on April 19th, 1943, he went back to the lab. And you know his process was, first you measure out a minute dose, you know, a dose that's sub-threshold. So he measured out 250 micrograms. Well, if any of you know about the dosing of LSD, that's not a sub-threshold dose. 
So Hoffman ingests in the lab 250 micrograms, and then he sits back to record that nothing happened. However, something did start to happen. His perceptual field started to change. He started to have a surge of affect. It all felt very, very strange. He figured something is wrong. He better go home. So he gets on his bicycle, because this was war, and I, they had to give up their cars for government purposes, and so he was riding his bike home, riding his bike home, and it really, it took forever. This was the famous bicycle ride. And um, uh, so um, he gets home, and he's starting to get very anxious because he doesn't understand what's happening. And he tells his wife, call the doctor. I think I'm dying. I'm going to bed. So he goes to bed, and he's lying there. But by the time the doctor got there, he was feeling great. And he was having these remarkable perceptual experiences. He was having just these unbelievable visions. He was flooded with positive insight. And there was something going on there that uh, was not quite what, what, what he had anticipated. But you know, the scientist that he was, he methodically explored this. He invited some of his colleagues to, sh to have an experience more controlled, and they were kind of prepared more as to what might happen. And in the late 40s, uh, the, um, the psychiatrist associated with Sandoz Pharmaceuticals, um, uh, which is who Hoffman worked for, um, sent samples of LSD to some of the leading psychiatrists in Europe and the US, suggesting that they, they might try this new drug, and they might better understand the experience of some of their patients. Now, some of these doctors started to take it from there and at first gave low doses to patients and finding it facilitated, you know, the psychoanalytic, psychodynamic psychotherapies that they were conducting. It lowered defenses. It increased insight. It facilitated articulation, facilitated rapport between the the therapist or the analyst and the patient. Some years later, they started to use higher dosages, and there they found very remarkable changes, therapeutic changes, in some of their most difficult to treat patients. And we'll talk about that in, in, in a couple of minutes. Let me talk about someone else who, who plays a very important role in the history of the emergence of psychedelics in modern culture. And this is Aldous Huxley. The, uh, the famous uh, British writer uh, who um, uh, left Britain in the uh, uh, early 40s and moved to Los Angeles where he spent th the rest of his life. And, um, you know, uh, Huxley was always interested in drugs. His, early, his great novel, Brave New World, you know, was about, uh, you know, drug experience in, a, um, in some future uh, society. Um, but um, Huxley uh, was very intrigued in the early 1950s by what he was starting to hear about psychedelics. And he developed a, uh, a, a, um, an exchange of letters with the uh, British-Canadian psychiatrist and investigator Humphrey Osmond, who was up in Saskatchewan in northwest Canada, uh, administering mescaline, which is primarily what he was using, to uh, alcoholics, because uh, Osman worked in a hospital where chronic alcoholics were treated. And as I'm sure you, many of you know, that alcoholism is one of the most difficult to treat uh, conditions in all of medicine, and Osman was getting remarkable therapeutic effects, which are very easy to identify in alcoholism because, I mean, you're either going to stop drinking or you're not. So it was very easy to measure that some individuals were had ceased to drink altogether. So um, they had this exchange of letters, and uh, during during which they uh, they came up with the term psychedelic, which translates from the Greek as uh, as mind manifesting. Huxley's first suggestion was phenerothyme. And, but we did not go through the Phenerothyme 60s. We went through the psychedelic 60s. So uh, Osmond's term kind of won the day. So Huxley, for, in the, during the last 10 years of his life, was fascinated with hallucinogens. In 1953, Osmond came to Los Angeles to the annual meeting of the American Psychiatric Association. And uh, they had arranged that he would facilitate for a mescaline experience of Huxley's. Huxley had a profound experience. He wrote about it in his, his book, Doors of Perception. And, um, and 
had only a handful of experiences over the final decade of his life, but was deeply taken by the profundity of his experience, by what he read of other, experience, other people's experience, and felt that this held great potential, for, really, for the future of our culture, that it could be a great tool for, for healing. Um, he was also quite horrified when in the early 60s, a Harvard psychologist named Timothy Leary started to uh, attract uh, a great deal of media attention. He actually went to Cambridge, Massachusetts to meet with Leary and pleaded with him to keep, keep his thoughts on psychedelics quiet because he was going to upset the apple cart and uh, make it more difficult to do this work in the future. And Leary said, of course, Aldous, I will not talk to the press any longer. And that lasted about a week. It's kind of like Donald Trump and his Twitter, you know. So, um, but then, you know, Huxley also felt that psychedelics had a role to play in the dying process. And he not only talked the talk, he walked the walk. So when he was dying of terminal throat cancer, he arranged with his doctor and his wife that at, at, as he was going into the final phases that he would be administered some LSD. And as he lay dying, the day he was dying, he could no longer speak, but he was capable of writing, and he wrote a, a note that he hand, handed to his wife, Laura, who, who actually I became good friends with for the last 15 years of her life. Um, and, you know, the, the, the note said, 100 micrograms. So they, the doctor injected 100 micrograms. He couldn't talk, so they never got a report as to what he was experiencing, but he appeared very much at peace and very quietly, gently, peacefully passed on. And Laura sat with him for a period of time. And then she tells me the story. After a while, she felt it was time to let everyone in the house know that Aldous had died. There apparently many close friends and some relatives were keeping vigil, you know, wait, waiting for Aldous, being there for support. So she walks into the living room area where everyone had been, and it was empty. No one was there. She starts looking around the house. She couldn't find them. Finally, she goes into a room off to the side where the only TV was, and everyone is clustered around the television set. And she was actually very angry. And she thought to herself, ha, huh, these people who profess such great love and devotion towards Aldous, they're watching television at this most poignant and meaningful of times. So she was going to reprimand them, but before she did so, she wanted to see what is it that they're watching. So she leans forward, and what she saw was that they were watching the first reports out of Dallas that President John Kennedy had been assassinated. So on the same day, November 22nd, 1963, Aldous Huxley passed away, and President Kennedy was assassinated. A, uh, a, 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 a remarkable, um, you know, kind of coincidence, I, I always felt. So, from, you know, Hoffman's discovery in 43 until the point in time when psychedelic research was shut down in the late 60s, early 70s, a great deal of research was conducted. Harvard psychiatrist Lester Grinspoon did a survey along with his colleague Jim Bacalar and identified in the, in the professional literature over 1,000 clinical papers discussing the experiences of upwards of 40,000 patients treated with hallucinogens. So this was, a, uh, this was actively being studied and during that time was considered the cutting edge of psychiatry. And, um, you know, and it was not only clinical psychiatry, clinical neuroscience also was fascinated with these compounds. And in fact, the discovery of serotonin actually occurred when a, uh, a psychiatrist slash neuroscientist named Daniel X. Friedman, who later became the chairman at University of Chicago, was doing a, wanted to do a study where he uh, uh, tagged with a isot radioactive isotope LSD, injected it into monkey subjects, subjected then the monkeys to the whatever state-of-the-art brain scan they had and found that certain areas were lighting up. Well, these areas turned out to be dense, were the dense collections of serotonergic nuclei were. So that was the first identification of the serotonin neuro neurotransmitter system. 
So it was felt to have great potential, and particularly in clinical conditions that do not respond well to conventional treatments. This is, and I personally believe this is what ought to be explored, are the treatment refractory conditions. And we, these are still, even in the modern era, not, uh, they, they, there are many conditions we don't do that well with. First and foremost, alcoholism. Osmond, in the late 50s, treated a large number of alcoholics with, um, with both uh, mescaline and later with LSD. And he did some, some follow-up surveys and found that upwards to one-third quickly relapsed to their alcoholism. Another third maintained their sobriety for a period of time, and then they relapsed. And then there was that final third that established sobriety and maintained it over the entire follow-up period, which I think was a couple of years. He found that what distinguished the long-term, that, that, that final group that maintained sobriety was that during the course of their many-hour psychedelic experience, they not only had, let's say, a powerful aesthetic experience or an experience rich in autobiographic insight, but they, they had what he described as a mystical level experience, a powerful psycho-spiritual epiphany. Uh, and uh, he felt that may have had something to do with their establishing, maintaining sobriety. And that, you know, that kind of reminds us of what the great early psychologist William James once had to say, talking about um, alcoholics, which in his day were sometimes called dipsomanics. So he said the best treatment for dipsomania is religiomania. And, and here you, you, have a, you have a treatment that may reliably facilitate spiritual level experience, which is you know very unusual for medicine, for psychiatry. Psychiatry have been very aversive to kind of looking at therapeutic aspects of spirituality or religion. Freud himself was very negative, you know, to, to such a concept, but there's something interesting. Osmond had some interesting observations. So other treatment applications, often difficult to treat, psychosomatic disorders, chronic PTSD, obsessive compulsive disorder, a notoriously difficult condition to treat, antisocial behaviors, uh, Autism. There are some interesting studies back in the late 50s with Loretta Bender in New York and Gary Fisher in California. They were actually treating children. Now, I've looked at some of the data, and it's, you know, it's pretty primitive data, and it's not actually altogether clear what these kids had. Some were probably autistic or on the autism spectrum. Uh, some were not, but um, they did report improvements of their, uh, of their overall function. So, and then finally, and what we're going to spend, I think, the rest of the time on is its use in, in addressing the off universal existential anxiety that emerges when individuals are approaching the end of life. So, you know, we're, we're all aware that, you know, the end of life is a terribly challenging period of time and uh, often associated with a great deal of depression, demoralization, anxiety, psychological isolation. Um, and it's not only overwhelming for the patient, it can be quite overwhelming for family, close friends as well, and even the attendant medical personnel. Now, oncology, the field of oncology has done a very good job in recent decades of expanding the duration of lives of individuals with uh, serious metastatic cancers, excuse me, but we still are challenged with addressing the quality of those lives in, in the remaining time. Now, looking at a psychedelic treatment model with uh, individuals near the end of life, some pertinent work was done in the early 60s by an internist in Chicago named Eric Cast, who was a pain specialist. And he heard about this new drug that had been discovered in Switzerland, and he was curious about it. He didn't know anything about it, really. So he wrote away for some samples, and in those days, any physician could just write to Sandoz and say, I'm Dr. So-and-so, I work with such and such patients, send me some of that new drug LSD, I want to see what it does. And, a few weeks later, you'd have a package in the mail. So he got some. 
but he didn't really know much. So he initially, as he made his rounds in the hospital with his patients with chronic pain, he would give them the, the drug, the LSD, and he would say, here's something new. I want you to try it sometime today, and tomorrow when I make my rounds, tell me what it did. Well, he quickly learned that's not how you administer this compound. So he, 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 he kind of got the message. And, but what he observed once he started to get a, a handle on how, how to administer it was it provided pretty impressive analgesia. And individuals reported lessened degrees of pain and re reduced need for narcotic pain medication. And that this effect, this pain-lowering effect, could be sustained even for weeks after the, the one-dose the one treatment. And I should mention that the remarkable aspect of a psychedelic treatment model is that very often you're talking about administering the compound only on one occasion or perhaps a couple of occasions spaced by a month or two, with it, but with often within the context of some kind of supportive or dynamic therapy. Now, uh, Cass, trying to figure out why this was happening, developed something called the theory of attenuation of anticipation, in that people with chronic pain are not only dealing with the pain in the minute, in the moment, they're also, you know, anticipating the pain that will most assuredly come. So they're in the moment with pain, and they're anticipating the pain that they're going to have, compounding the negative effects. He found with this LSD treatment, individuals were able to step back from this anticipation and kind of break the cycle, and consequently, report, you know, they might still have some pain, but it wasn't as severe, and they didn't need as much uh, narcotic to, to handle the pain. He also found almost as a... And after thought that there was that mood was improving and anxiety was uh, was diminishing. So um, Cass almost uh, accidentally made some very interesting discoveries. Now Walter Pankey, the the Harvard psychiatrist, later went to the University of Maryland and uh, the Maryland State Psychiatric Center at Spring Grove, decided to treat people with terminal cancer, and he found that in terms of their psychological status, not the cancer, again, we're, no one is talking about treating cancer, it's all the psychological sequelae. Uh, he found about a third improved dramatically, a third improved moderately, and a third didn't appear to be affected. And curiously enough, he found, similar to what Osmond found with his alcoholics, that those people who had the most effective therapeutic outcome reported having had some kind of mystical level experience. So he was very taken with perhaps the mystico-mimetic effects of, of, of these drugs, and it was associated with sustained drop in fear, anxiety, uh, depression, demoralization. So, and he also observed pain meds were of, sometimes not needed a, as much. And afterwards, there was this kind of afterglow that could be sustained for days or weeks, or even longer than that, where individuals had a very serene sense, very peaceful, very calm, and a noticeable drop in their fear of death. Pankey had a, had a senior colleague, Stanislav Graf, originally from Prague, late, later at Maryland. Graf actually, what, perhaps the most experienced of the researchers of the early generation with uh, psychedelics was in the US uh, you know, kind of visiting um, some psychiatric departments when uh, the, when the uh, Prague Spring came to an end and the Russian tanks rolled in, couldn't go back to Czechoslovakia, or uh, decided not to go back to Czechoslovakia and got a position at Maryland and uh, continued to work with psychedelics and found colleagues like Albert Kurland and Walter Pankey. Uh, and he and Graf developed a larger scale study of uh, treating terminal patients with LSD and also another compound, DPT, which can be injected intramuscularly. And he also found about a third improved r rather dramatically. And overall, um, you know, upwards to 65% uh, had some level of, uh, uh, of improvement. And also, Graf found that um, it impacted their ch attitude to towards death, increased acceptance, 
and most notably in those who had powerful psycho-spiritual religious experience. Now, curiously, the, the nature of the religious experience was quite consistent with the belief system of the individual. It wasn't that individuals started to have powerful religious experience of some religion they, they had no background in, but it was in, in their own belief system. Why their, their, the, the power impacted an amplification of, uh, of, their, relig of their religious or spiritual uh, experience. How how are we with time? So I'm going. Okay, I got time. I'm I'm going a little slow here. I hope you don't mind. So do, we'll bump it up to the current era. Uh, psilocybin research has been ongoing since the 90s. Um, in Zurich, uh, Franz Vollenweider has done some remarkable work uh, uh, with neuroimaging, uh, kind of mapping out the. Uh, the, the areas in the brain which are affected. I should also acknowledge the Imperial, Imperial College London group of Robin Carhart Harris and David Nutt, who have both been here, have done some great work in the last several years. But Franz Vollenweider, who works actually out of the Berkholtzy Clinic at University of Zurich, which is where Jung worked, you know, back in the early 1900s, um, has a, a very productive lab. So here you see some of his early... Um, his early uh, work, uh, you know, looking at, um, you know, PET, uh, images of the brain. And you can see this is uh, the baseline brain. And um, this is actually your brain on drugs. You know, in the United States, during the war on drugs, active war on drugs, Nancy Reagan made a big deal about, you know, danger of the drug. And, you know, she had some points to make, but it was also quite over the top. There was one commercial that played often in the U.S. saying uh, they would hold up an egg and say, this is your brain, and they crack the egg, toss it in a frying pan, start sizzling, and say, and this is your brain on drugs. No, that's not true. This is your brain on drugs. <laughs> so you've got, you know, it activates more activity in the uh, frontal, lateral, frontal, medial part of the brain, anterior cingulate. And uh, this has been elaborated further, but uh, Franz has done really great work. Um, here, here's some data from Francisco Moreno at the University of Arizona, who did a study of uh, chronic refractory uh, obsessive compulsive disorder patients. And he found uh, what he described as a positive, acute, robust change. He didn't have that long of a follow-up period. And unfortunately, no one has stepped up to, to do another more extensive study of chronic OCD. In fact, I had an email a couple of days ago from a young man who said, you know, he said, you know, he has chronic OCD. It's in, he's incapacitated by it. Conventional treatments haven't touched him. Isn't there any study he could volunteer to be a subject in? Sadly, there's not. But Francisco certainly has established a foundation that hopefully someone or some other groups will, will build on. Some important work at Johns Hopkins, um, where they have been able to, looking at this, um, this possibility that psychedelics can facilitate mystical experiences, they've demonstrated that indeed that's the case. If you prepare someone, create optimal conditions, you can almost reliably induce powerful mystical level experiences, which um, as we saw with Osmond and Groff and Pankey, might be predictive of therapeutic outcome. Here he had a controlled study, methylphenidate or Ritalin was the, uh, the control drug, and uh, predictably Ritalin, they talked a lot more, but uh, the other measures, um, you know, the emotive measures, and, and also, and also um, you know, other measures. I don't have this, I, I didn't include the slides, but also slides looking at the kind of spiritual level experience. And they, they've, they've consistently been able to demonstrate that they can reliably facilitate these kinds of experiences, which is very important, has very important clinical uh, implications. So then we'll move ahead to um, our study and what we had to do to get permission. Because keep in mind, decades passed and no one around the world, had, well, not no one around the world, because you had Volenweider in the early, in the, um, early 90s, and you did have a couple of German psychiatrists like Hans Karl Leuner, who was working with psychedelics, but at least in the United States, everything was shut down altogether from the late 60s, early 70s until the early 90s. In the early 90s, 
Strasman at University of New Mexico got permission to do a DMT study. My group at Harvard UCLA got permission to do an MDMA study, and Deb Mesh at University of Miami got permission to do an Ibogaine study. So in the early 90s, it started to open up. But you know, there were, there were a good 20, 25 years where the field was moribund. It was shut down altogether entirely because of the cultural and political reaction to the 1960s and the fact that these drugs during the 60s were associated with a politically active counterculture, which was perceived as quite threatening. So understandable, unfortunate, because a lot of time was lost. A lot of time was lost in regards to conducting basic studies, exploring the range of effects of these compounds. So now we're things are starting to build up, and we need to catch up, and there really is a need for more groups around the world to get involved in this area, because it is rich in potential, really, to help us on further understand range, you know, mechanisms of action, you know, function of the central nervous system, and also these remarkable uh, treatment applications, particularly for patient populations that don't respond well to conventional treatments. So we got permission to work with uh, 12 subjects with metastatic cancer, they all had overwhelming anxiety that was deemed to be re resultant of the impending end of life. Um, so it was an existential anxiety. And we worked with an adult population. Our method, and we had exclusion criteria. No, we, we excluded anyone with uh, primary brain cancer or metastatic disease of the brain because there is a possibility that someone with uh, brain cancer, that this could lower their seizure threshold. And Stan Groff actually worked with people with uh, metastatic brain cancer and had good outcomes. But we were concerned that if a patient started had serious seizures, the FDA would feel compelled to shut down the study. Again, this is the first study of its kind in 25 years. We also excluded severe cardiovascular illness. We excluded uh, people with hypertension had to be effectively treated. You had to have normal liver function and kidney function and so forth, so on. Also, no histories of people with schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. And um, yeah. So everybody, they were screened into the study. They had, came in for several sessions with myself and my, uh, my co-investigator. Uh, they had the preparatory psychotherapy where we established rapport. And we, they, we, we explained to them you know, the range of experience they might have. We got to know them. We got to un understand the issues, you know, not only surrounding their illness, but also it's important to understand other facets of their lives and their life histories. Um, we utilize a double-blind placebo control methodology. Uh, we use as our uh, placebo niacin. It was a placebo used in the 60s. Um, if I was to do it again, I would choose a different placebo, but we, we did choose niacin. We were approved at a moderate dose. Uh, I actually, I asked for a higher dose, and FDA said, no one has looked at this compound in humans in several decades. Let's start cautiously. So we, they wanted us to use 0.1 milligram per kilogram. We wanted 0.3. We kind of settled on 0.2. And, you know, and, and it's actually we got, it turned out to be a very effective um, dose. We, we had our clinical research unit, our NIMH-funded unit, and we had, a, we had significant, uh, we followed up for six months, and we provided, um, you know, in some intensive um, therapeutic integration of that experience the day of, the day after, <clears throat> and then, you know, for some weeks or months, depending upon, you know, the need of the patient, the condition of the patient, their proximity to us geographically, if they're capable of getting into the hospital. So um, we worked on our inpatient research unit, and many of you are, of course, familiar with uh, what a very drab, you know, appearance a, a hospital room could have. But fortunately, my co-investigator had a real good handle on fixing up uh, rooms. So we had uh, wall hangings and flowers, and we had people bring in pictures. And we, we had access to the room on the research unit that had previously been the, the sleep research room. So we had two heavy doors one after the other, that blocked out all the, the ambient sound in the hall, which is really important. And, uh, and we kind of cocooned people in there. The procedure was, um, you know, we kind of, you know, we already knew these people well. They would come in the night before, get worked up by, by the medical team, because that was, that was our, our part of the protocol. 
uh, myself and my co-investigator would get there early in the morning. Uh, we would, again, you know, kind of work with them to uh, kind of, you know, you know, just kind of review what the purpose of, of the, the day was going to be, kind of look at their intention, and uh, administered the compound. Then we had them lie down, put eye shades on, headphones on. They listened to pre-selected music. Every hour I checked in with them. We did a blood pressure. I asked them, how are you doing? What's going on? They could sit up at any time, take off the shades, take off the headphones, and engage in whatever process. But I would often encourage them, you know, if there was a lot of, why don't you just go back deep into the experience? But we, there's plenty of time later to process and talk about what, what was going on. So um, these are some of our instruments. We looked at mood measures, anxiety measures. Uh, we looked at, uh, you know, different pain measures and quality of life measures. Yeah, and we had a six-month follow-up. Now, I'm often asked, why didn't you work with LSD? Because that was what most research studies in the 60s were, were using. Well, there, there are a number of reasons. One is psilocybin is somewhat gentler, less intense. It's easier to guide someone through the experience. Um, it's a shorter duration experience, four to six compared to eight to 12, and that's pr of practical importance. Has a strong visionary component, more likely to induce positive mood. And very, very importantly, it's associated with less likelihood of anxiety or, or panic, less likelihood of, of paranoia. But mo maybe most important of all, nobody had any idea or preconceived notions of what psilocybin was. If we work with LSD, everybody knows about LSD because everybody knows about the 60s. And that would have been a magnet for the press, which we were trying to keep away. And, uh, you know, we, and, you know we, we wanted to avoid any association with Timothy Leary, who's, uh, you know, who's, whose name would be like uh, a toxin for this field. So, um, and it was also psilocybin, as opposed to LSD, be easier to recruit patients or subjects into the study. So psilocybin turned out to be a very good choice, we feel. And most of the modern-day studies are working with psilocybin. There's only one, has only been one LSD study, and that's uh, Peter Gosser in uh, Sulitur in Switzerland, who did a, uh, a, a, a uh, you know, kind of a small-scale end-of-life anxiety, similar to what we did, but he did it with LSD. We actually had better results. Um, but, you know, one study, one, I mean, it doesn't mean anything. I mean, it, it, certainly Groff and Pankey and the others got excellent results with LSD. So regulatory hurdles. Um, in the United States, you've got to go through the FDA, the DEA. I work in California. We have kind of our own in-state kind of, uh, you know, regulatory system. And I don't know if you can make out what the acronym for the California Research Advisory Panel is, but uh, it wasn't that bad. It really was okay. Then our own in-house IRB and research committee. And I will say that um, working with like people at the FDA turned out to be a very positive experience. I was very concerned that they would be hostile and antagonistic and negative about what we were doing. No, not at all. They just wanted us to come up with a, uh, a safe study and a feasible study. And there was a lot of back and forth, a lot of communication. And I think we ended up, because of like the FDA input and research advisory panel input, uh, we ended up with a better protocol. We had to make some changes, and sometimes I was a little resistant about that, but, you know, you, you can't argue with the FDA. And, and at the end, I was very happy with the protocol we were allowed to work with. Now, we treated 12 people. Curiously, 11 of the 12 were women. I have no explanation for that, but uh, that's what it was of our subjects. Uh, you know, they range in age from the mid-30s to the late 50s. Four had metastatic breast cancer, three colon or colorectal cancer, two ovarian cancer, and then there was a case of multiple myeloma, salivary, salivary gland cancer, and peritoneal cancer. Everyone has passed on. Everyone passed on within, uh, you know, w within a few years. They were not expected. To, they all had end-stage cancer, and uh, we saw no discernible effects on the cancer itself. Um, physiologically, you know, very minor effects on uh, heart rate, minor effects on blood pressure. You can see it, uh, blood pressure barely moves at all. The diastolic only goes up into the at peak mid-70s, which is not at all a problem. One of my co-investigators was a, uh, the chief of cardiology at my hospital, so we did 24-hour Holter monitors, and he found between placebo sessions and psilocybin sessions, no uh, 
No significant differences. We worked with um, uh, the uh, five-dimension altered state of consciousness profile uh, developed by Dietrich in uh, Germany. Uh, so we looked at oceanic, bound oceanic boundlessness, um, ego dissolution, uh, uh, visionary restructuring, auditory alterations, reduced visual, uh, vigilance, and com you know, compared to control. There's some you know, very powerful effects of the active medicine. These are some of the sub sub areas we looked at. You could just see briefly what they are. And looking at um, mood, we see uh, initially, you know, no difference between placebo group and active drug group. Um, but then, I should also, I need to mention one other thing, methodologically. Everybody received um, two sessions spaced a month apart. One, they got one active medicine treatment, they got one placebo treatment, um, and what was blinded was the order. That was randomized. So I didn't know, my co-investigator didn't know, the subjects didn't know, but they, we did decide to tell them ahead of time that um, they would get one of each. We, did, we felt it would be, it might be better science just to have a pure placebo group, but we felt it was ethically problematic not to provide and a powerful experience like this that people were kind of desperately wanting to have it. They were at the end of life. If it was any condition other than advanced cancer, I would have argued for a pure placebo group. But for people who are close to the end of life, I, I, I couldn't bring myself to deny them that experience. So, we were, so when we contrast one group with the other, it was, you know, for those f after the first session. But then after the second session, then we could look at, you know, everyone. And you can see with mood, the Beck depression inventory, a sustained uh, reduction of depression with reaching significant proportions by month six, which it's a small end, a small cohort of patients, subjects, so we were, we were actually surprised we got uh, significance. Then looking at the state trade anxiety inventory, looking at um, state, which is the anxiety you feel in the moment, both uh, acutely and over time, not much of, no difference between uh, no difference between the two, and um, and no difference cumulatively for everyone uh, with state anxiety. But interesting enough, trade anxiety. Whereas, you know, for initially looking at one group versus the other, no change. But looking at everyone after they got their psilocybin session, a sustained reduction of trade anxiety, which is how you generally see your your level of anxiety, and and reach significant proportions. So again, with a small n, this was. We felt this was quite impressive, and so our colleagues also agreed. We got it published in the Archives of General Psychiatry, which has subsequently been renamed JAMA Psychiatry. It's the number one impact journal in the field, so we felt this was a marker that our uh, colleagues were looking at this area of research with respect and understanding that, and, as a, a, and signaling that it really needs to be explored, that after 20, 30 years of turning our backs on it and uh, refusing to engage, not being allowed to engage in any formal research, it was time. We've perhaps finally overcome the, uh, all the traumas uh, and the anxieties of the 60s and, uh, and we're able to move forward with this work. And again, this field is opening up to investigators in the US, to investigators in Europe. And um, so I think, uh, we're kind of moving out of uh, our own dark ages that we're able to do studies. Now, there have been a couple follow-up studies to what we did on the east coast of the US. At NYU, Steve Ross's group, uh, we actually gave him our protocol. And that's, he used the identical protocol, except by the time he was going to the FDA, the FDA was satisfied that we had established good safety parameters. He was allowed to use a higher group, a higher dose. He also was allowed to use uh, not allowed, but he had funding for more subjects. He actually got even stronger significant findings than we did, and he has published his findings in December 2016, as did the Hopkins group. The Hopkins group didn't get quite as good an outcome, I think, because they had a different protocol, and they were using a different placebo. Now, we, niacin 
is not a great placebo because some people are nice and sensitive, but uh, it was a lot better than what they used, which was um, very low dose psilocybin. So that's, and we're learning now with the new interest in so-called microdosing that, you know, what doses we used to think were sub-threshold, actually something is going on. So using a very low dose uh, psilocybin as placebo was problematic because they were having experiences, you know, kind of maybe not powerful, mystical generating, um, uh, knock your socks off kind of level experiences, but something was going on. But they still had significant results and it's still a, a, a valuable study and a valuable contribution to the literature. So one of the pioneer researchers from the 50s and 60s uh, at, at UCLA, Sidney Cohen, wrote, death must become a more, talking about working with the dying, working with people at the end of life, working with the psychedelic treatment model, Death must become a more human experience to preserve the dignity of death and prevent the living from abandoning or distancing themselves from the dying is one of the great dilemmas of modern medicine. That was the case in 65 when he published these remarks. Still the case today. This is my group, um, or at least the names. And this is Alicia Danforth. She's, she's my co-investigator for most of my st work in the last 12 years. And she's, it's really, you need, you need a, uh, I, I'm a believer in a male-female therapy team, and it needs to be a, a team that's compatible with one another. I know of one, case, one study some years ago where uh, the, uh, the, the male-female team were uh, feuding about something, and, you know, patients can pick that up. The, the, this, this substance amplifies process. If you bring in goodwill and harmony into the room, that gets amplified. If you bring in you know, anger and um, resentment towards the other therapist, the patient's gonna pick that up. So this is very, very important. You get the right people to work in this field and you get the right chemistry. You know, this, and Hefter Research Institute, you know, provided most of the funding along with Betsy Gordon. Now, if I, I added one additional slide because as we're moving forward into the future, I think, you know, we need to, look at a, uh, several issues. One is we need to, you know, respect what previous investigators learned. You know, this, we're not inventing anything brand new. Not only was there that pioneer generation in the 50s and 60s, which really laid down the foundation, which we've picked up on, but there's, you know, there's a wealth of information out there from indigenous people going back time immemorial. So look at the anthropology. I've actually collaborated quite a bit on uh, on, uh, on, on some writing projects that we've published with the anthropologist Marlene Dopkin de Rios, looking at um, how indigenous people utilize plant hallucinogens as rites of initiation. And I think there's some valuable lessons to be learned. I mean, we're modern era, you know, societies and we're not indigenous people, but they learned a lot about set and setting. They learned how to optimize outcome for what their needs were. There's something to be learned. We shouldn't casually dismiss them or feel that their, 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 <clears throat> their knowledge was too primitive for us. Safety is of utmost importance. We need to really be scrupulous in our establishment of safety parameters. Um, there's another study in the U.S., I won't name it, but they somehow or other got permission to use an astronomical dose of psilocybin. Their, one of their, this was a normal volunteer study. One of their subjects on... Uh, 0 0.6 milligram per kilogram, which is way too high, had, had an experience that he, as he was processing and trying to integrate it, he, he, wrote, he wrote it up, and then he decided to get it published online. And the title of the article is something along the lines of, I received the highest FDA-approved dose ever of psilocybin. And I just cringed when I saw that. And I was horrified that these investigators um, had... Uh, had, had, had wanted to administer such a w way too high dose. And I was actually concerned that it had been approved by the regulatory agency. I don't think it should have. Ethical standards, again, are very, very important. Um, you know, there are ethical issues in all branches of medicine. There's ethical issues throughout the mental health field, just in general. Psychedelics will amplify, you know, anything that's there, you know, you know investigators, subjects, and so you were really working to protect these subjects. We need to maintain the highest ethical standards. 
We need to prioritize public health implications. We don't want to be encouraging people to take these compounds, particularly young people. We don't want them to take it under unwise settings. We don't want vulnerable people to be taking these compounds. There, there are implicit risks that we need to be cognizant of. And when people do get in trouble out in the world, we also need to understand how, how we need to intervene to address what has happened. Um, we need more diversity. If you look at the research teams, it, it's basically white men. That's problematic. There needs to be, you know, people of color. Women need better representation in this field. And, um, and I think that will actually foster a lot of positive change if we had greater diversity. We need to understand how to work with the regulatory agencies. And we also need to at least examine or understand the critical issue of funding. For the longest time, the field, we, now we established feasibility with the regulatory agencies, but progress was slow because there was no funding. Recently, a few very, very wealthy people are pouring a lot of money into this, but then to what degree might they feel they get to control what's done, who does it? So, and are they doing this for financial gain? That's problematic as well. You know, um, I, I, I believe the federal granting agencies need to step up and recognize this as, as a priority field and not leave it to just a handful of, uh, of the extremely wealthy. But um, so that, these are all um, challenges for the future. You got a lot of you guys, the younger guys here, you are the future. I hope some of you go into this field. There's a lot of good work that uh, could be done, that should be done. And I think together we could kind of really, we could, we could really start to develop treatment models that could help people who otherwise often don't get help by, um, by conventional treatment. So this was the cutting edge back in the 50s and, and early 60s. It went off the tracks because of cultural reasons. The culture wasn't ready. We've now had, you know, almost half a century now to overcome the 60s and deal with it. And, uh, and again, yeah, it's, it's time to do more work. And I think we've got some, we've laid, we've laid a good foundation over what was a very good foundation from the pioneers from the 50s and 60s. And now it's up to the next generation to take it to the next level. So thank you very much. I'm really happy I had the opportunity to sh share our work with you.